the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Welcome to the second day of Craft Lit, our 12-day Christmas story extravaganza. Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Today on our second day, I bring you two quite different texts. The first one is a morality play, and we haven't done a whole lot of these on Craftlet before, but I've talked about them a lot because they actually have a, a fairly significant place in the history of literature, just as literature goes. In the Middle Ages, we started getting mystery plays, miracle plays, and morality plays. These were allegorical, so they had characters who were supposed to portray either moral qualities like charity or an abstract quality like death or love. And one of the things that happens in a morality play is you are taught a moral. Uh, I think the York mystery cycle was one of the bigger ones took place in York, England. And you'd have a town square and a bunch of caravans, like almost like a, a stereotypical gypsy caravan. You'd have a bunch of these pull around in a circle, and instead of having the normal seat in the front and a door in the back, they had, along with that, a side that would flip down and turn into a stage. If you saw the movie version, of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, you saw this exact kind of thing. And so when mystery plays were done, they would ring the town square with a bunch of these caravan stages, and they would perform the show that lived in that particular wagon, caravan thing. So you, as a person who has to work for a living, you could show up at whatever time you could show up at, and you could go and catch the first play in the cycle. The Christmas play might be the first play in the cycle. Or if it was the entire life of Jesus cycle, it might start with the Annunciation. And that would be one story that would be acted out. And then you'd move on to the next story. And you'd see John the Baptist. And then you'd move on to the next story. And so you could walk through, not just the Stations of the Cross, but you'd walk through the entire New Testament is a great way to communicate information to people, especially when your audience wasn't particularly literate at the time. Well, this time we have a morality play. And usually there's a a kind of an everyman character who is going through some kind of trauma being assaulted by bad things like greed and lust and things like that. And we would see our everyman, of course, find a way to be strong and triumph in the end against the powers of bad morality. <laughs> and he would be be able to win out because mercy and justice and truth would show up and help him save himself. Well, our morality play today is a little bit different because it's a Christmas morality play. It was written by a woman named Grace Latimer Jones, who sounded really familiar to me, except I can't find anything about her on the internet. I did find a small entrance in a women's who's who book from way back, where she was listed as being a graduate of Bryn Mawr College here in Pennsylvania. Woot! And uh, she ran a, a girls' school in Columbus, Ohio, I think. So she was born, near as I can tell, she was born in 1879. She graduated from Bryn Mawr in 1900, which means she was right around the same age as Dascom Bacon, who wrote Biscuits Ex Machina, the Smith College stories. Grace Latimer Jones dropped off the radar. We know her birth date, but we don't have her death date or any other information, but we do know that she was a principal and half-owner of a school for girls in Columbus, Ohio. She was very active in the world of education. She was a suffragette, or at least she was sympathetic to getting votes for women. And she liked to travel in Europe. And that is everything I could find out about her. Her name pops up over and over again, but 
related to the play that we're going to listen to. Not much else. It's the first time this has happened in almost 12 years of Craftlet where I haven't been able to track down any real biographical information on an author. So we are experiencing one of those moments that women's studies people talk about often, that women's day-to-day lives just didn't make the grade as far as having it written down and kept in a place where it would be accessible to future generations. She may have kept a diary. It wasn't published. She wasn't Virginia Woolf. And she wasn't the author of our other story today, O. Henry. Now, O. Henry is another interesting character, and we have done O. Henry stories on Craft Lit before. But just to refresh your memory, O. Henry's real name was William Sidney Porter. He was born in 1862. He died in 1910. He was only 47 years old, and he had had kind of a rough go of it. Only towards the end, he was able to finally marry his high school sweetheart, and that lasted two years, and within another year, he was dead. He was drinking pretty heavily. He died of cirrhosis of the liver, complications of diabetes, and an enlarged heart. The guy just wasn't doing very well. But... Prior to him drinking himself into an early grave, kind of literally, he did a lot of writing. He didn't start off as a writer, but eventually, I think in 1902, he moved to New York City, and from that point on, he really was doing nothing but writing. He wrote about a short story a week, and critics, just like we're seeing with the Jeeves stories and P.G. Woodhouse, critics sometimes were not so kind to O. Henry. I personally love O. Henry stories because they always have a little twist at the end. Today's story is not so much about irony. Today's story is really just sweet, but it does have a twist at the end. You'll probably see it coming because you are a modern listener and these things are not new. However, remember on the first day of Craftlet, I said there were going to be many stories we came across where where they could be filed under the more things change, the more things stay the same. I think the morality play may surprise you because the things people were complaining about back in 1918 are still things that people are complaining about now. Nothing much changes. Be that as it may, it is a lovely little play. It is read by actual acting type people and you'll recognize some of these voices from previous stories that we've done, especially Ruth Golding, who read, among many other things, Wuthering Heights beautifully for us way back in the day. If you are interested at craftlit.com slash second dash 2017, so that's second spelled out S-E-C-O-N-D, and then a hyphen, and then 2017. If you are interested, you can go there. You can see what little biographical information I got on our Grace Latimer Jones. You can read a little about O. Henry on your own. You can also access the e-texts of these stories as well. I've linked out to all of that for you. And I've also linked to a recipe for plum pudding, because these are the only two things that I think I need to tell you before we listen. Number one, plum pudding, British. If you live in the United States, You may never have even come across one of these, uh, but they are the thing in in the UK. And I don't want to shock you, but one of the things you do is you pour liquor on the pudding. You can find out more by following the recipe and seeing how this works. But there is a joke coming about the liquor in the plum pudding. So that's why you needed that. The second thing is in O. Henry. He mentions a ritama tree. R-E-T-A-M-A. I had never heard this phrase, and when I went to go look it up, I was shocked. Because in Tucson, where I had lived, we called them Palo Verde trees. P-A-L-O, stick, Verde, V-E-R-D-E, green, the green stick tree. Well, the Ritama tree is pretty much the same thing. It is a green stick tree. They are both in the same family, They are not the same tree. Their flowers are different, and the green stickiness of the sticks is a little different as well. So when you hear the line about the Ritama tree, there's a mention that one who is crossed in love should never breathe the odor from the blossoms of the Ritama tree. It stirs the memory to a dangerous degree. I posit that this is because the pollen in the flowers of these trees 
is so strong. I don't remember them smelling mesquite smells, creosote smells. I don't remember Palo Verde trees smelling. I do remember them making everybody sneeze all day long, every day, until the bloody flowers dropped off. But O. Henry, who lived in Texas for a while, seems to have a different relationship with the tree. I'll let him have his version. I know the truth. And as always with the O. Henry story, anytime we have old stories, public domain stories that exist anywhere in the world where people encounter people unlike them, we always run the risk of people using terminology that we simply don't use anymore. Uh, There's a very mild version of that in the O. Henry story. It's nothing shocking. It's just one of those things that my, my ears kind of perked up and I said, oh, well, yeah, it's an old story. And if you're listening with children, you will have to let me know if they figured out what was going on with the morality play before you did. With that too, I have my theories. All right, let's listen to What Makes Christmas Christmas by Grace Latimer Jones and The Chaparral Christmas by O. Henry. What Makes Christmas, Christmas, by Grace Latimer Jones Characters Christmas Gifts, read by Charlotte Duckett Money, read by Ruth Golding Christmas Tree, read by Amanda Friday Christmas Stocking, read by Ginger Cucolo Plum Pudding, read by Rapunzelina Spirit, read by Lynn Silva An Old Man, read by David Olson. The Child, read by Evie Maria. King's Son, read by David Lawrence. Narrator, read by Pamela Krantz. (laughs) What Makes Christmas Christmas? A Morality Play. The Scene. At the sides and back, the stage is hung with curtains of a cold gray tone lighter toward the top. In the upper left corner, a bright star is shining. Across the top at the front hangs a dark gray curtain, stenciled in a geometric design with dull gold paint. A dark line of drapery borders the sides of the proscenium. A little to the right, center, and more than halfway back is a stone bench with a pine tree at each end. The light is diffused and dim, to represent night. In the distance, an almost imperceptible regular drumming is heard. During the solemn parts of the play, this monotonous beat is always audible, determining the tempo of the movement. There enters right Christmas gifts, a coquettish, elf-like figure in a gold tunic and a stiff skirt, stopping at the knees. On her head is a gold cap like a cornucopia, and her stockings and slippers are gold. She enters dancing. She is followed by Moneybag, who loiters sulkily behind, examining a little musical pipe which she carries. Moneybag is dressed in a loose brown bag, tied up about the neck with a hempen rope. Otherwise he looks a little like a brownie. Why are you so excited, Gifts? Why, it's Christmas Eve, Mr. Moneybag. She curtsies mockingly. Christmas is no better for Gifts than any other time of year. What's the matter with birthdays? Poor old Moneybag. Kissing him and dancing off. It's such a great drain on you. Yes, it is. See how poor and thin I've grown. A month ago, my sides were all bulgy with my savings. But it's a season I thrive. You thrive, my lady, at my expense. I want to dance, money dear. Caressingly. Play me a nice little tune. Whenever you want anything, then you're very nice to me with your money dears. You always have to rely on me for whatever you want. Money makes the dance go, yes. You're not a very aesthetic creature, though. Money tosses his head angrily. Oh, but we all love you. You're ever so much better than you look. Come, play me a nice little tune to dance to. Tra-la-la-la-la, tra-la-la-la-la. 
still pouting and shaking his head. I think my pipe is broken. He plays a few discords. Always broke when I ask you for anything. Come, just one little tune. Money begins to play and Gifts starts her dance. <laughs> Suddenly, abruptly in the middle of a strain, Money breaks off and begins to examine his pipe with great interest. Oh, do play. Stamping her foot. It's so tantalizing, Money, to have you give out this way. Yes, it's money this and money that at your beck and call all the while. I can't keep on forever, can I, with no pauses to catch my breath? It's hard work to keep time all the time. There's a good old money bag. Kissing him. A nice old money bag. Of course, you have to pretend that times are hard. Money grunts and begins to play. <sighs> After a few bars, he again stops abruptly on a high note and falls to examining his pipe. You always give out this way at the crucial moment, dear money bag. Just one more little strain. The strain's too much for me. How stingy you are. And your music is pretty poor too. I notice it's good enough for your dancing. I'd dance to a different tune if I could. Airily. It's my artistic temperament anyway, which furnishes all the charm. Artistic temperament, indeed. When did that ever furnish anything but trouble, I'd like to know? Enter left, Christmas tree. He wears a short, flaring green tunic, trimmed with horizontal evergreen bands, green knickers, brown stockings, and scarlet slippers. On his head is a peaked green cap. From time to time, electric lights shine out on the point of his cap and in the evergreen bands. Here, here, you two squabbling again. Why, it's Christmas Eve, the time for shouting and laughter. See how I shine. The bulbs glow and flicker out. He won't play for me. Oh, yes, he will, and like a right good fellow, too. Why, one hour more, and it will be Christmas, Mr. Bag. See how I shine with the festive spirit. The lights glow a moment. Now, if ever, is the time to play. Come, Gifts, we'll have a little dance together. They caper about, but Money continues to sulk and examine his pipe. Come, come, Money. What would Gifts be without you? She can expect no more of me. Gifts, flinging arms round his neck. Dear old Money Bag. You're too fickle. Not in loving you. This is the season of jollity. See how I shine. The lights glow again. Just one short piece, then. He begins to play. Gifts and tree join hands. It's scandalous the way you treat him. You're so changeable. You seem to forget the Christmas gifts must be all things to all men. They dance. Presently the music stops again on a high note in the middle of a strain. Money is given out again. A new tune starts up merrily as Stocking enters left. He wears a blue and white doublet and a square cap on his head. On the whole, he resembles a checked pantaloon more than anything else. Stocking dances gaily while gifts and tree give him the floor. Poor Stocking. It's very seldom money spends any effort on him. You mean it's very seldom money is ever spent on him. Women are so reckless in what they say. Stocking stops, breathless. How well you dance tonight, Stocking. On Christmas Eve, I always dance well. I'm dancing dreams into the heads of all the children. The stockings are hung by the chimney with care, you know. That's the very core of the whole thing. What would Christmas be without me? Why, I am Christmas. Rubbish, old fellow. You're all right, of course. In fact, you play your part very nicely. But what would Christmas be without a tree? See how I shine. The lamps glow. Sooner a Christmas any time without a tree than without a stocking. Why, it's the whole joy of Christmas to hang up your stocking, have dreams dancing on your head all night, and dash down in the morning to pull out... Gifts. There you are. It's gifts they're after. What would an empty stocking be? It's gifts, gifts, gifts that makes them happy. Stocking is about to retort, but Tree pushes him aside. 
There, there, don't quarrel. We all admit that Christmas would be a pretty slow thing without you, Stocking, and that you'd be a pretty disappointing fellow without gifts. You're both essential to Christmas. I, I guess, guess so. so. Christmas Eve and no stocking. Why, it's inconceivable. Who ever heard of a Christmas with no gifts? Why, I enter every lowest hovel, bringing joy wherever I go, and spreading Christmas cheer. I visit the rich man in his villa, and the convict in his prison, and the soldier in his trench. Everywhere I go, helping, encouraging. Sententiously. Making all men brothers. The whole world becomes one vast fraternity under the charm of Christmas gifts. Wherever I look, I will see Christmas smiling. See how I shine. The lamps flash. What is a home without me when Christmas dawns? Why, I am the very center and symbol of joy. Round me the family gather and look at me with smiling eyes. I am the shrine of Christmas. Christmas is Christmas without a single gift. If I stand shining by the hearth, hmm, where would you all be without me? Who ever heard of anyone's keeping Christmas without money? I may not make as much show as some of you here, but money's the biggest thing in life. What's a man without money? Where can he live? What can he eat? What can he do? I build canals and palaces and the great ships that sail on the sea. I wage war and bring back peace again. I erect hospitals and bring men healing and comfort. Without me, the whole world would fall into chaos and the race of men would perish. Christmas without money, indeed. Here comes Plum Pudding. He has attended countless Christmas festivals. Yes, but think of his reputation. I'll admit that he isn't averse to a little liquor and is often in his cups. But he's a man of the world and has seen life. He ought to know what makes Christmas Christmas. Let's lay the whole matter squarely before him and abide by his decision. Yes, Plum Pudding knows what's what. I agree. And I. And I. Enter left, Plum Pudding. He is a portly old gentleman dressed in black velvet with red stockings and a red sash. Good evening, Mr. Pudding. We're having a little discussion here about who's most essential to Christmas. Now I just tell them, please, what Christmas would be without a tree. See how I shine. The lamps glow. Hum, <laughs> Mr. Pudding, did you ever hear of a Christmas without gifts? She takes his arm coquettishly and smiles up at him. <clears throat> well, no. Of course you didn't. Where would they all be, sir, without me? Put them all straight now. See how I shine. The lamps glow. Did you ever hear of a child who forgot to hang up his stocking on Christmas Eve? There's a good deal of wisdom in all these claims. Christmas would indeed be a poor thing without stocking. See how I shine. The lamps glow. A tree is very important. Gifts pulls his arm, and no one would be willingly forgotten by gifts. He smiles at her without money. Yes, where would they all be without money? Eh? Where indeed? Well, 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 well. What is it that makes Christmas Christmas? What? 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 Is it possible you don't know? All shake their heads. Gifts. Smiling at him. What do you think? Think? I don't think. I know. Oh. 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 What is the road to a man's heart? Why, his stomach, of course. Do you see? Plum pudding is what makes Christmas Christmas. Didn't you all refer to me? Plum pudding turns and struts off right in a superior manner. Always puts himself above everybody else. Too much ego, my dear tree. Always overestimating his own importance. The way to a man's heart is through his purse. Why, I can tell you. A gay tinkling sound is heard, and a lithe, yellow-clad figure enters right. She is dancing and is picking imaginary flowers. Spirit. I am young and take pride in the flowers in my hair. My foot's a wild cherry, 
This is no one I know. No, I. Spirit, still gathering imaginary flowers and weaving them into wreaths. Morning glories and rue and harebells growing with daisies. I don't see anything. All growing under the Christmas star. She thinks they're there. Perish the thought. All sweet flowers for my garland. The rose, the lily, and the stately dahlia. Tree stepping up to her. See how I shine. The lamps glow. Oh no, no! Drawing back. You're no child of the wood and meadow. So my dress being tatters, my footsteps alight. The stars in the sky happy when I see. She'll be asking us to have a cup of moonlight next. She's mad. I'll speak to her. What's your name? I seek with a bee, draining sweet from the thorn. Joy touches my heart like the wing of a bird. Well, where did you come from? I can't say the exact place. I have come from the mountains of the Sierra Nevada, down through a great sweep of wheat country. So I wandered along the banks of the Ohio, and touched the hills again, and passed into the mist, over the waves, into the great turmoil of the nations. But where is your home? Singing as she pleats her wreaths. When the sun shines out, the spring is my cup, and I hear from the thrush that her nestling is full. You see, she won't tell. I pass here and there, lodging the hearts of men, and I reach down and set my magic on children. Aren't you cold out in the night with that thin dress? The December winds are blowing down from the great ice fields in the north, but I am not cold at all, for my heart warms me. This is no time to be thinking about yourself. This is Christmas night, don't you know that? The time when there's love and good will among men, and every one is giving himself in joy and service for others. See how I shine! The lamps gleam. The spirit looks about her, bewildered. Everybody is expected to give a little. I have flowers. They're only in your mind. Enjoy and laughter. They don't cost anything. They're just in the hearts of the people. Holding out his cap to her. Everybody is expected to give a little. That's much too small to contain my gifts. The spirit disappears. Whoever saw the like, such as some folk have. Enter right an old man with his little grandson. They are very poor and wretched. The old man carries on his back a sack which contains all his possessions, and the little boy has a swag on the end of a stick. They come in and rest themselves and their burdens on the bench. I am old, old by a hundred years and wearied out. Yet it's near midnight, and we must be getting on to some shelter. How far must we go, grandfather? It's always a long way, child, that the poor must travel, a long and weary way. Money slinking away. They're beggars. Gifts coming forward. It's Christmas Eve, my good man, and the hour of midnight is near. I was coming to seek you. I'm gifts. Christmas is for the rich. Bitterly. Not for us poor folk, driven forth on the road, to celebrate with gifts. See how I shine. The lamps gleam. On Christmas Eve, even the poor man can bear home a balsam from the hills and light a taper in its branches to the blessed child. To shine into the eyes of his own children, old man, turning away. It's a roof tree that I'm lacking this Christmas Eve, young man. But though the poor man has no home, he has yet a fire where the Christmas stocking may hang. Tonight, the highway is my hearth, friend. Enter left the spirit and touches the old man on the sleeve. Father, I too have come a long road on Christmas night. And I'm going a longer still. Shall we not go on together? Ah, company on the long dark road. That's something now, my friends. Where did you get those flowers? Mad, mad, mad. 
You see, we're very poor, my grandson and I. We're too poor to keep Christmas. I didn't see any flowers, Grandfather, as we came along. But now, why are they growing everywhere? And what a fine smell they have! Can't you see how she's fooling you? Where are her flowers now? But can a fine lady like you be seen on the road with poor folks like us? King schemes for him in his manger. Then let us be getting along, for the road is dark and difficult. The way is bright with moonlight, and the hedges are thick with daisies and harebells, and the meadows are dotted with buttercups. We shall pass orchards too, with plums and peaches, and big and little apples, and hanging grapes on a trellis. Incredulously. This reminds me of the days when I too was young and unwearied. And before us, fate will run like a wild deer on the mountains. Oh, rarer than wealth are the flowers on my brow, and fairer than peace the flame in my heart. The old man and the child go out left with a confident air, accompanied by the spirit. As they go, they do not heed the others. She carries a high head now and despises us as if she were our betters. There they go, a couple of poor daft shadows begging along the road, a reproach to good people who are enjoying Christmas. A cloud of incense rises behind the spirit and the old man and child. Don't you see a mist rising there? Odd. And smell a holy fire. And together they have passed into the mist. And who is she anyway? And what was her business here on Christmas night? She's only a poor mad thing with her flowers and her orchards and her moonlight. It's an ill time to be meeting creatures like that. The holy Christmas Eve. The old man's coat was very poor indeed. He needed a new one. His hood was all tattered, and his stockings were only rags. But he refuses our assistance. That's the way of the poor. They'd rather freeze before our eyes than ease us by taking help. He listened to her quick enough. To empty promises and vain hopes held out, with all her talk about flowers. Yes. See how I. He jumps aside, startled, and cries out. She has taken away my shine. The others look on in amazement. A pox on her for taking away the good old ways of celebrating Christmas. Suddenly, the king's son appears left on the highway. He is dressed in a short purple tunic and wears a golden circlet on his brow. Money immediately runs forward to salute him. Money always follows in the footsteps of the great. All stand in the way of the king's son, saluting him. He looks peevish and is evidently annoyed at the interruption. What do you want of me? It was to you, sire, that we were about to proceed. It was to you, first of all, in the wide realm, that we would bring our Christmas greetings. And who are you, pray? I am Christmas Gifts, with my faithful attendant money bag. And we have saved for you the rarest and best. But I don't want any more gifts. Already the palace is filled up with them: birthday gifts, christening gifts, Christmas gifts, 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 till my eyes are tired of looking. Sire, you are right. I am the only true symbol of Christmas. I, the Christmas stocking. You hang me up in the chimney corner, and all night long dreams and fancies dance over your head. I'm much too old for such nonsense. Why, I haven't hung up my stocking for ever so long. Sire, I am the Christmas tree. See how I shine. He hesitates to try, but the lights gleam out again. I am the shrine of Christmas. On Christmas morning, the family gather round me. I'm tired of Christmas trees. I have them every year. And they're always the same. All these things are nothing to me, for in my heart there is a great heaviness. What is it that makes Christmas Christmas? I have set out tonight on the great highway of the realm to see whether I shall find Christmas there. I have left my father's house, where I walk between walls of beaten bronze, lighted with silver lamps, and where my father sits on a high throne with a crown on his head. And a mastiff at his feet, in the courtyard, festive preparations are going forth, and there is a great coming in of kings and princes. But Christmas joy has deserted our palace. I remember the time when my heart was high on Christmas night. 
But now everything is sodden and dull. Enter left spirit dancing. No gem and no gold can my spirit oppress. No mesh and no net stay the wing of my flight. Who is she? He goes toward her. Spirit gathering flowers and singing. The summer leaves fall when the harvest is ripe. The lark song is heard when the shadows are long. There is a princess in the court who has come up from the south and sits pining for me by the window. But I'll have none of her. And now when I put out my arms to you, you do not come. All men have a deep thirst for joy. Come to my father's house, and we will dance together in the gardens. You and I, playmates. Oh, no, no. In palaces there are sad hearts, burdened with the duties of Christmas. I must be happy and free. But I will make it different. You may come and go as you will, and you may have a great tall gendarme to keep away anyone who annoys you. And you can console yourself by giving to the poor, who are always near the golden gate. Spirit dancing away and singing. I pine and I sigh for no gift and no gold. The glow in the west is treasure to me. The spirit disappears. It does a heap of good to talk to her. She won't even listen to the king's son. Enter left the old man and the boy. Alas, joy caught at my sleeve and disappeared. It is the only thing which will not dwell in palaces. She was taken away from us, as everything else is taken. Because there was nothing there. To the old man. She and her flowers were an empty show to delude poor daft folks like you. With her, the way was not dark. While she ran beside us, we walked in moonlight. Then she ran ahead. She would wait for us, she said, at the crossroads further on. And she vanished like dew. But when she was gone, our sorrow returned, and the weariness of the way, and we could not see ahead. The poor, too. She held in her hands joy like a great light. I saw it shining there, and it vanished again. My light! She stole it from me for a little while. What did I tell you? Empty promises. He thought she would wait for his coming at the crossroads. Her blossoms bloomed only a moment, old father. Then she deserted you, leaving you on the road alone. And she left me, too. Our promises were much more substantial, but you turned from them to her flowers. Did you touch them then? Did you take them in your hands? What I see is mine. She offered fair sight to our eyes and gentle thoughts to our hearts, such as belong to the poor and to the children and to poets. The king and the rich hold their possessions in their hands. But who can play the tyrant with the eye and the thought of a poor man? Hark! Again she is filling the air with her sweet sounds. All stop and listen. Spirit sings in the distance and is not seen. My voice meets the voice of the forest and cloud, but the sun never shines on the gold of the reach. It is strange. Her figure is not here. Yet the sound comes to us like the film of a dream. The form, too, is here, if you see it. Spirit still in the distance. My life is a joy that no mystery clouds. With no pain and no takes, I give and I get. This night my longing has been fulfilled. And the poor have been happy. This is no place for us. Gifts, money, tree, and stockings slink away left as the spirit continues to sing, still in the distance. My fancy, my palace, my joy, my throne, my dreams are my realm, and my garlands my crown. Though she speeds over the earth tonight, her spirit has found its resting place. For she dwells in our hearts. The drum beats heavily twelve times. Curtain End of What Makes Christmas Christmas by Grace Latimer Jones
A Chaparral Christmas Gift by O. Henry The original cause of the trouble was about twenty years in growing. At the end of that time, it was worth it. Had you lived anywhere within fifty miles of Sundown Ranch, you would have heard of it. It possessed a quantity of jet-black hair, a pair of extremely frank deep brown eyes, and a laugh that rippled across the prairie like the sound of a hidden brook. The name of it was Rosita McMullen, and she was the daughter of Old Man McMullen of the Sundown Sheep Ranch. There came riding on red roan steeds, or, or to be more explicit, on a paint on a flea-bitten sorrel, two wooers. One was Madison Lane, and the other was the Frio Kid. But at that time they did not call him the Frio Kid, for he had not earned the honors of special nomenclature. His name was simply Johnny McRoy. It must not be supposed that these two were the sum of the agreeable Rosita's admirers. The Broncos of a dozen others champed their bits at the long hitching rack of the Sundown Ranch. Many were the sheep's eyes that were cast in the savannas that did not belong to the flocks of Dan McMullen. But of all the cavaliers, Madison Lane and Johnny McRoy galloped far ahead. Wherefore they are to be chronicled. Madison Lane, a young cattleman from the Nueces country, won the race. He and Rosita were married on Christmas Day. Armed, hilarious, vociferous, magnanimous, the cowmen and the sheepmen, laying aside their hereditary hatred, joined forces to celebrate the occasion. Sundown Ranch was sonorous with the cracking of jokes and six-shooters, the shine of buckles and bright eyes, the outspoken congratulations of the herders of kine. But while the wedding feast was at its liveliest, there descended upon it Johnny McRoy, bitten by jealousy like one possessed. "'I'll give you a Christmas present!' he yelled shrilly at the door with his forty-five in his hand. Even then he had some reputation as an offhand shot. His first bullet cut a neat underbit in Madison Lane's right ear. The barrel of his gun moved an inch. The next shot would have been the bride's, had not Carson, a sheepman, possessed a mind with triggers somewhat well-oiled and in repair. The guns of the wedding party had been hung in their belts upon nails in the wall when they sat at table, as a concession to good taste. But Carson, with great promptness, hurled his plate of roast venison and frijoles at McRoy, spoiling his aim. The second bullet, then, only shattered the white petals of a Spanish dagger flower suspended two feet above Rosita's head. The guests spurned their chairs and jumped for their weapons. It was considered an improper act to shoot the bride and groom at a wedding. In about six seconds there were twenty or so bullets due to be whizzing in the direction of Mr. McRoy. "'I'll shoot better next time,' yelled Johnny, "'and there'll be a next time.' He backed rapidly out the door. Carson, the sheepman, spurred on to attempt further exploits by the success of his plate-throwing, was first to reach the door— McRoy's bullet from the darkness laid him low. The cattleman then swept out upon him, calling for vengeance, for while the slaughter of a sheepman has not always lacked condonement, it was a decided misdemeanor in this instance. Carson was innocent. He was no accomplice at the matrimonial proceedings, nor had anyone heard him quote the line, Christmas comes but once a year to the guests. But the sortie failed in its vengeance. McRoy was on his horse and away, shouting back curses and threats as he galloped into the concealing chaparral. That night was the birth night of the Frijo Kid. He became the bad man of that portion of the state. The rejection of his suit by Miss McMullen turned him into a dangerous man. When officers went after him for the shooting of Carson, he killed two of them and entered upon the life of an outlaw. He became a marvelous shot with either hand. He would turn up in towns and settlements, raise a quarrel at the slightest opportunity, pick off his man, and laugh at the officers of the law. He was so cool, so deadly, so rapid, so inhumanly bloodthirsty, that none but faint attempts were ever made to capture him. When he was at last shot and killed by a little one-armed Mexican who was nearly dead himself from fright, the Frio kid had the deaths of eighteen men on his head. 
About half of these were killed in fair duels, depending on the quickness of the draw. The other half were men whom he assassinated with absolute wantonness and cruelty. Many tales are told along the border of his impudent courage and daring, but he was not one of the breed of desperados who have seasons of generosity and even of softness. They say he never had mercy on the object of his anger. Yet at this and every Christmas time, it is well to give each one credit, if it can be done, for whatever speck of good he may have possessed. If the Frio kid ever did a kindly act or felt a throb of generosity in his heart, it was once at such a time and season, and this is the way it happened. One who has been crossed in love should never breathe the odor from the blossoms of the retama tree. It stirs the memory to a dangerous degree. One December in the Friho country there was a retama tree in full bloom, for the winter had been as warm as springtime. That way rode the Friho kid and his satellite and co-murderer, Mexican Frank. The kid reined in his mustang and sat in his saddle, thoughtful and grim, with dangerously narrowing eyes. The rich, sweet smell touched him somewhere beneath his ice and iron. "'I don't know what I've been thinking about, Mex,' he remarked in his usual mild drawl, "'to have forgotten all about a Christmas present I got to give. I'm going to ride over tomorrow night and shoot Madison Lane in his own house. He got my girl. Rosita would have had me if he hadn't cut into the game.' I wonder why I happen to overlook it up to now. Ah, oh, shucks, kid, said Mexican. Don't talk foolishness. You know you can't get within a mile of Mad Lane's house tomorrow night. I see old man Allen day before yesterday, and he says Mad is going to have Christmas doings at his house. You remember how you shot up the festivities when Mad was married and about the threats you made? Don't you suppose Mad Lane will kind of keep his eyes open for a certain Mr. Kid? You plum make me tired, kid, with such remarks. I'm going, repeated the Frio kid without heat, to go to Madison Lane's Christmas doings and kill him. I ought to have done it a long time ago. Why, Max, just two weeks ago, I dreamed me and Rosita was married instead of her and him, and we was living in a house, and I could see her smiling at me, and, oh, hell, Max, he got her, and I'll get him. Yes, sir, on Christmas Eve he got her, and them's when I'll get him. There's other ways of committing suicide, advised Mexican. Why don't you go out and surrender to the sheriff? I'll get him, said the kid. Christmas Eve fell as balmy as April. Perhaps there was a hint of faraway frostiness in the air, but it tingles like seltzer, perfumed faintly with late prairie blossoms, and the mesquite grass. When night came, the five or six rooms of the ranch house were brightly lit. In one room was a Christmas tree, for the lanes had a boy of three, and a dozen or more guests were expected from the nearer ranches. At nightfall, Madison Lane called aside Jim Belcher and three other cowboys employed on his ranch. "'Now, boys,' said Lane, "'keep your eyes open. Walk around the house and watch the road well.' All of you know the Frio Kid, as they call him now, and if you see him, open fire on him without asking any questions. I'm not afraid of his coming round, but Rosita is. She's been afraid he'd come in on us every Christmas since we were married. The guests had arrived in buckboards and on horseback, and were making themselves comfortable inside. The evening went along pleasantly. The guests enjoyed and praised Rosita's excellent supper, and afterward the men scattered in groups about the rooms or in the broad gallery, smoking and chatting. The Christmas tree, of course, delighted the youngsters, and above all were they pleased when Santa Claus himself in magnificent white beard and furs appeared and began to distribute the toys. "'It's my papa,' announced Billy Sampson, aged six. "'I've seen him wear them before.' Berkeley, a sheepman, an old friend of Lane, stopped Rosita as she was passing by him on the gallery, where he was sitting smoking. "'Well, Mrs. Lane,' said he, "'I suppose by this Christmas you've gotten over being afraid of that fellow McRoy, haven't you? Madison and I have talked about it, you know.' "'Very nearly,' said Rosita, smiling. "'But I am still nervous sometimes. 
I shall never forget that awful time when he came so near to killing us. He's the most cold-hearted villain in the world, said Berkeley. The citizens all along the border ought to turn out and hunt him down like a wolf. He has committed awful crimes, said Rosita. But I don't know. I think there is a spot of good somewhere in everybody. He was not always bad. That I know. Rosita turned into the hallway between the rooms. Santa Claus, in muffling whiskers and furs, was just coming through. "'I heard what you said through the window, Mrs. Lane,' he said. "'I was just going down in my pocket for a Christmas present for your husband. But I've left one for you instead. It's in the room to your right.' "'Oh, thank you, kind Santa Claus,' said Rosita brightly. Rosita went into the room while Santa Claus stepped into the cooler air of the yard. She found no one in the room but Madison. "'Where is my present that Santa said he left for me in here?' she asked. "'Haven't seen anything in the way of a present,' said her husband, laughing. "'Unless he could have meant me.' The next day, Gabriel Rad, the foreman of the X.O. Ranch, dropped into the post office at Loma Alta. "'Well, the free old kid's got his dose of lead at last,' he remarked to the postmaster. That so? How'd it happen? One of Sanchez's Mexican sheep herders did it. Think of it. The Frio kid killed by a sheep herder. The greaser saw him riding along past his camp about twelve o'clock last night and was so scared that he up with a Winchester and let him have it. Funniest part of it was the kid was dressed up all with white Angora skin whiskers and a regular Santa Claus rig out from head to foot. Think of the free old kid playing Santy. End of a Chaparral Christmas Gift by O. Henry Read by Winston Tharp So that was sweet, right? I mean, it sounds like a Western. Somebody's going to get killed all the way up until the end. And it's always, it's always a surprise to me somehow when O. Henry gets, not romantic, but kind of sentimental at the end, even if it's only for a sentence. But sentimentality definitely played a part in our other story, What Makes Christmas Christmas, especially once the poor man and the child come on. And I will not lie to you. I am such a softie around this time of year, I got all choked up when the child could see the flowers. To me, that was just, just perfect. And if you were listening to kids, did they get the whole money bags and gifts and, and the fir tree? The fir tree and the lights kept being interchangeable, and that's because the Christmas tree has lights on it. That's all that was. But I thought the Christmas tree was hysterical that every time you turn around, you hear her, see how I shine. Christmas isn't all about you. It's all about me. See how I shine. I think that's going to have to become our new catchphrase. Total goofiness and some good Christmas fun. Alrighty, you take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And we'll be around with more 12 Days of Craft Lit. The tomorrow stars are brightly shining it is the night of the dear savior's birth long lay the world in sin and ever pining till he appeared and the soul don't forget, you can put Craftlet's Scotland June 2018 tour on your wish list. Or, if you are feeling so inclined, you can get that tour for your favorite Craftlet listener. You can call 1-800-826-2266 and talk to Diane or anyone else at Holiday Vacations. They will be happy to help you and give you the skinny on our trip. Or, you can click in the sidebar at craftlet.com on the little picture of the hidden cows and that'll take you to the brochure and you can see 
all of the fabulous places that we're going to go. And January 2018, we will begin Anne of Green Gables. If you like what you hear, please leave us a review on iTunes, like us on Facebook. You can download our app for iOS devices, Android devices, Windows phones. You can listen to Craftlet on Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.